This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Fees and generous donations from viewers like you. Good afternoon. This is a joint meeting of the Community Resources Committee and the Finance Committee for June 2nd, 2020. And the meeting pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law 30A, Section 18, is a meeting of the, the two committees and is being conducted via remote participation. So I'm going to call the Finance Committee to order, and then I am going to go, th which I have just done now, and then go through for each member of the committee and recognize you by name and ask you to indicate that you can hear me and you can, and, and to, then we'll know you can be heard to confirm your participation. Um, and uh, then I'm going to ask Mandy to call the um, Community Resources Committee together and do the same thing for her committee. Uh, and this is necessary in order to complete the beginning of the process. So, uh, Pat D'Angelis, are you here? Present. Pat? Present. Okay, thank you. Lynn Griesmer? Yes. Uh, Dorothy Pam? Yes. Okay, Kathy Shane? Yes. And um, then we have three people. I'm just going to, so that everybody can confirm they're here. These are um, non voting community members of the committee, but they are members of our committee and very important members. Um, Bob Hegner? I'm here. Can you just? And Sharon Pavanelli. I'm here. And Mary Lou Talman. Do you need to unmute I'm Mary here. Lou or? Okay. So we are complete. Um, I turn this over to Mandy Jo for a minute. Thank you, Andy. Um, it is now 2.07, I guess. And I will call seeing a quorum presence the June 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Community Resources Committee joined with the Finance Committee to order. Um, I will go through the roll and make sure everyone can hear us. Shalini Balmilm. Present. Uh, Evan Ross. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. And I believe Sarah Swartz is still not present. Um, so we are working on figuring out whether she can attend or not, um, but she is not present at the time and obviously Mandy Johanneke is present. And I'm going to turn it back over to Andy who will be running this portion of the meeting. When this portion is over, I will call a recess of the Community Resources Committee so we can reconvene in a different Zoom room. And I will explain that as we go. Lynn, uh, can you put up the... Uh agenda for a moment for everybody to see and while you do so let me um, follow up on what was just said <clears throat> this is actually a joint meeting of two committees and um, if you go down a little bit what you'll see is that the first order after calling the meeting order which we just did is to have a presentation of the community preservation act committee recommendations for um, FY21, and uh, there's uh, Nate Buddington, who's chair of the committee, is present and is going to make that presentation in, in just a moment. Uh, the, what I'm going to do afterwards is, uh, after he makes his presentation, uh, we are going to have uh, questions uh, to come from all councilor members of the committee. And I'm gonna try my best to recognize people in the order that I see raised hands on the participant list and uh, not organized by way of committee. Um, I will then open it up for public comment 
the public comment period at that point will not be on other issues that either committee will be um, addressing later in this agenda, but will be on um, the Community Preservation Act part of the um, discussion today. Um, the, when the committees um, then divide into separate meetings, in the way that logistically is going to happen is that the Finance Committee is going to stay with this Zoom meeting and members at that point, members of the Community Resources Committee are going to leave this meeting and then join another meeting so that people who are interested in staying with that committee from the public will need to also um, take a similar um, action of uh, in order to get to the next meet to continue with that meeting. Um, and uh, I think that that basically takes care of the, lo the logistics explanation of how we're proceeding. So the other thing I was going to ask um, you to put up if you can is the financial order, Lynn, if you have it available. And if not, I can do it from my computer. Um, the reason that I'm asking for the financial order and um, Lynn, are you, are you able to find it or? There it is. Okay. Um, the, this is a proposed, uh, as you see marked as a draft financial order that will come before the council on June 15th. And the uh, purpose of this is to be able to vote on and any, and, uh, <clears throat> any of the projects that are listed, which are the ones that are funded from the FY21 funds. Um, and uh, we very much would like to be able to um, fund those projects that um, are supported by the council so that they can um, have full advantage of the fiscal year to work on the project work. And um, for that reason, um, that is the major focus of this. And we will need the, uh, pres the, the everybody to understand that and need to have the committees decide whether they have recommendations to the council for the June 15th meeting. Um, the uh, one item that was recommended by the committee that has a minority report attached to it um, has to do with Jones Library funding, has to do with um, it, it, is, it would be funded by borrowing. And um, it was not, it is not part of the uh, draft financial order that you're looking at right now. It will not be considered by the council in June there is no date for consideration of the uh, Jones Library proposal. Um, so it is part of the report as part of uh, that was referred and this has been referred to both committees. Um, but I, it is not the major focus of discussion today. However, if questions come up from the committee, um, I'm not going to um, say that they're inappropriate questions, but I just want to try and make sure that people focus on what we need to do on June 15th. Um, our council president is also a member of the Finance Committee. Lynn, is there anything else you want to say to what I just um, said in the introduction? No, I, it, I will add that we're not taking the library up at this time because we really don't know when that funding may or may not come through as a grant. And until it does, we really have no reason to act on it because it would be contingent anyway. Uh, but also, I just wanted to bring to your attention that one of the other members of the CPA and Anthony Delaney, who staffs CPA, are in the attendees room. Would you like me to bring them in? Uh, I think we can go ahead and bring them into the meeting because, uh, uh, as you point out, one of the staff to the, um, and assisted with the CPA, Anthony and Sarah is a member of the committee. By the way, there are no other attendees at this time. I had looked at that a few minutes ago. 
to the participant list. Um, so with that um, introduction, I'd like to now introduce uh, Nate Buddington and welcome you, Nate. And um, uh, I um, had asked you, um, we had talked earlier today and I explained what I just explained to the committee so that Nate can um, make a presentation and uh, then um, open it up to questions after that. So Nate, please go ahead. Uh, would you like me to stop at the end of each proposal to take questions or do you want me to go through the whole thing? Um, would it make sense? Are you going to be presenting by section uh, starting at the top with housing? I'm going to follow your uh, transfer order if you'd like. Okay, okay well, they are, uh, since they're done in, in grouping, do you want to do the community housing and then we'll see if there are questions and then okay. start preservation questions? Do it in that fashion? Okay. So do each category and then take questions at the end. Okay. Yes, why don't we do that? Okay. First, before I start, uh, I just want to give my uh, annual shout out to Anthony Delaney, who is our liaison with Town Hall. Uh, he's um, a pivotal part of this process. He gets us information really promptly. We get fantastic support from him. Uh, he just makes the process so much easier. So I just wanted to acknowledge his, his really excellent work with us. Um, so we have two uh, community housing um, proposals this year that we've both uh, approved on the committee. One is um, a um, $200,000 appropriation to the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. This is, I believe, the third year in a row when we have awarded um, some monies to the trust in order to bank uh, to be able to use as leverage um, if we have a proposal comes up with a, with a developer where um, we really need to, to show that we have um, resources to immediately participate in that project. Uh, the trust usually asks us for 400,000 a year. We usually give them half of that. Um, I think they probably have amassed about 400 to $500,000 at this point. That includes this year's $200,000 um, uh, appropriation. Uh, they don't do anything with that money without conferring with, with Town Hall, um, but it is there for immediate use if it's needed to leverage uh, work with the developer. Um, we uh, also have a $234,000 appropriation for Valley CDC's program for a first time home buyers and mortgage subsidy program. This is to provide uh, four $50,000 um, uh, mortgage subsidies to qual for qualifying families. Um, they do, uh, there is a little, some obviously some um, cost sharing here. They have to um, contribute 3% uh, of the cost of the house as a, a down payment um, and they have to pay closing costs. Uh, the, the, so there's four $50,000 mortgage subsidies. The remaining amount of money, $35,000, <clears> it's articulated in their proposal as a consulting uh, and advising for people who come into this process. I'm not sure that that word is really the right word. Uh, it's really, I guess what I would call maintenance costs to run this program. One of the things that happens with these mortgage subsidy programs is they will um, have to reject the vast majority of the people who apply. So there's a tremendous amount of vetting um, with these different applicants. Um, they have to uh, you know, have time to review the inspection documents. They have to inspect the house. Um, so there's a number of costs, uh, part of which is um, the counseling piece that goes as they're vetting the applicants. Uh, they say that they end up uh, really doing some fairly important um, home buying counseling for almost anyone who even applies in the process. But that, that term uh, really, I think, is the wrong term. It's, it's really the, the maintenance of the program, which includes the counseling piece that takes up that remaining, I think it's 30 something thousand dollars. 
those are our two housing projects. So, um, I don't see any raised hands in just a second. I, um, yes, Lynn. Um, Nate, I don't know that you know this for sure, but am I correct that the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust is using some of the money they have for the rent subsidy program during this COVID period? My impression is that they are, but I, okay. I haven't I just spoken people, to Don about that. Yeah, I just wanted people to be aware that in addition to maybe working with developers in this case, they're actually using it also to respond to the present situation we're in. Evan has his hand raised. Yeah, I see Evan and Mandy has her hand raised. Evan? Yeah, actually, I, my, my question was actually based on what Lynn said, which was that um, when this was voted by CPA, this was pre-COVID and pre uh, the housing trusts making that decision. My, my understanding is that they have about about 500,000 in the trust and they voted 250 of it towards this rental program, which would half their funds. And so I guess I was curious if there had been any consideration in CPA, given that they asked for 400,000 and you agreed to fund 200,000, um, if there had been any consideration given what's happened since to reconsidering that and upping their amount to help offset what they spent on this rental program. We can't consider it because we haven't been allowed to meet. So there's no medium for us to talk about what, that very issue, which is a really good one. There had been a long period of time, as you know, and um, other committees that were not elected boards were not meeting by uh, Zoom because there was not the ability to provide IT support for all committees. Uh, and we've just now gotten into that next phase um, where we are beginning to have more capacity to do that. But I think that uh, what Nate is uh, pointing out is, is that CPA committee got into a time trap because of that. Um, I think that the uh, um, other point that I'd make and that I want to recognize Mandy and Kathy, whose hand is up now too, is that the uh, committee could meet again now and make a recommendation and the council could make a supplemental um, order um, adding money to the trust later in the year that we're no longer because we're not a town meeting anymore that only meets twice a year but we meet every month we can um, it can be a year-round process and so um, money can be added if, if available yeah, yeah. um sonia did you have something yeah i just wanted to add that in this proposal from cpa there is a three hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollar um budget reserve plus there's also a fifty thousand dollar housing reserve so um, that gives us the ability to go back inappropriately or if we need to. If we don't reserve this and the tax rate is set, then we couldn't do that, but we can do it because we have this reserve in here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if there are questions about that, they should, um, we'll come back to it from questions. Uh, Mandy. Thank you. Um, question about some of it's just affordable housing, the community housing program in general and the funds in general. I thank you for providing the spent reports, the prior year's reports and, and where they are on spending and all. Um, so for the first time home buyer program, in the report there indicated there was a recapture of amounts in event of sale deed or transfer, deed transfer or, or refinancing. And so I'm curious who recaptures those amounts. Does that go back to Valley CDC for an additional sort of home buyer subsidy to say a fifth person, or does it come back to the CPA? Um, so that's my first question. And then the second one is we've got a lot of outstanding community housing grants out of CPA that haven't been spent, particularly some for rental subsidies from last year. 
um, that went to ACC. I think there was a full housing, uh, another home buyer's assistance program from a couple of years ago that hasn't had any money spent in it either. Um, does the CPA program uh, ever go back and, and sort of get an idea as to where those are or why some of those have not been spent? You know, I, I'm curious, particularly on the home buyer program and that rental subsidy, given the current situation and this current program, I know the home buyer was a different entity, um, but you did mention it's really hard, hard to find them. Um, and so I don't want to tie up money if it's not going to get used for five or 10 or 15 years, you know, because they can't find anyone. So could you talk a little bit about that too, Nate? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, this year <clears throat> on the committee, we, we, um, you know, we were kind of looking at what appeared to be a lot of outstanding money, some of it from years ago that had never been spent. And uh, we really wanted to get on top of that because we wanted, a pro we wanted to have a process whereby we could say, if this money isn't spent in three years, it's returned to the CPA. It's a little squirrely right now in the agreements of whether that really takes place. And we really wanted to uh, firm that up. And we did put that into our revised plan, CPA plan. Um, uh, but we, we also are in the process, we have a subcommittee on CPA to do largely what you're just talking about, which is to come up with a system where we can account for what has happened to previously appropriated funds. Um, and we've been getting some information from other town CPAs to come up with a good system for doing that. It's not locked in yet. I hope we're going to have it for the next year's cycle. Um, and um, your first question again, I'm sorry, I already blanked out on it. Yeah, the first question was about the, the oh, money comes home back. buyer programming and who recaptures that. Right. Uh, it, it, the money comes back to the town. It was a little unclear to me whether it comes to the CPA or it goes into the, it goes to the town directly. But um, uh, Sonia probably has the answer to that. Yes, Sonia? So all CPA funds do, do go back directly to the um, CPA fund. It depends on the funding source in there. If it came from a housing reserve, it would go back to housing reserve. If it came from um, open space reserve, it would go back to the open space reserve. But if it came from the pot, it would just go right back to the CPA fund balance and it would be available for appropriation for the following year. Uh, Kathy, your hand is up too. Yeah, I, Sonia answered part of my question. Um, it, it's linked to, to Evans on a, if CPA gets to meet again, can they look again at housing? And I'm just wondering what we're saying is available in total to CPA for FY21. So how much is the 3% that's our surcharge and the expected state match and do we is that state match certain or not so when sonia when you said how much would be in reserve is that including the money we're expecting to get from state match or just off our own so um it's cpa kind of runs like the operating budget it's estimated and it's the year before so um the state match for this fiscal year has already been received, it was at 11.2%, I believe, and I had estimated 11%. Typically, um, surcharges are estimated at about 950,000 coming in from the surcharge, and then whatever the percentage the state tells us at the time. Now, for fiscal year 22, that's going to be, that's unknown at this point in time. But, um, did I answer that question right? Yeah. So when when you talked about the it's be the amount being reserved, it's counting both of those sources. It's counting everything, yes. Because okay. at the beginning of the year, we figure out what we have that we're going to be able to spend and what we estimate the yep. revenues, and then that's set aside. But the three seventy seven, I would caution we're going to we're going to um, budget it as a reserve. But I would watch carefully as the CPA money coming in to make sure that we're actually going to meet that before we spend it all. So I'll be watching that. Thank you. Yeah. Dorothy, I see your hand up. So none of this money is actually in an account called CPA. Is that correct? It's all somewhere else? 
or is there an account that's called a CPA account where money they put aside that they don't spend sits? It's called a receipt secure for appropriation account and it's labeled Community Preservation Act Fund. So we have to appropriate from that. It works just like an ambulance fund. So you, you appropriate from that fund and then you move it to a capital project fund to be able to spend on individual projects. But everything always goes back to that receipt reserve so it's available for appropriations again. It's a separate reporting that we have to do with the state and the auditors every year. Okay. Andy? Hey. Yes. Uh, I want to go back to the two housing and just check my uh, knowledge or rem memory on this. I also believe the uh, Municipal Affordable Housing Trust is holding the money for East Street School. And we don't seem to be moving on that because we run into all kinds of issues about whether it's really, we can do it the way we wanted to. It was the first RFP failed. Um, so I just want to check that I'm correct that that money is held by the Amherst uh, Municipal House Affordable Housing Trust. And the second question I have is really on the Valley CDC money and whether any of that money could be used for first time home buyers who are now in mortgage trouble because of job loss. Well, that's yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I guess, I, I, I don't know. That, that that's sort of beyond uh, CPA's jurisdiction. Um, to your first point about the East Street School, um, the original um, idea behind uh, the trust being able to bank a certain amount of money was that if a project like the East Street School came up or the East Street School in itself, that we would be able to jump on. On At that time, we were working under the town meeting framework where you know, CPA was really limited on when we could act. Um, and, and it was a way to anticipate either that, prog that project, East Street School, or something like it should something come up. But one, it's, it's been, allocated to the trust. So I believe that it stays with the trust until spent. And if it's not going to be spent, it stays with the affordable housing trust. Right. Now, I think one of the, um, you know, if we go to this model of uh, it in three years, if something isn't spent, you know, we have the option of, of asking for that money to be returned unless another arrangement is made. Um, it could come into play with the, with the trust's money. Although it has, that's a fairly specific purpose, you know, to hold on to that money for leveraging, which could potentially go beyond the three year or arbitrary three year time frame. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because it really is, you know, it's just sitting there and we don't seem to be able to move on that building and if more money was needed, needed for rent subsidy, that would be another source. It absolutely. And it is something that the uh, housing trust would have to decide on. The, uh, if there are no other questions on housing, then I wanted to um, let Nick go on to the next section, which is the historic preservation grant lines uh we have four uh historical preservation um items uh one uh is with the north amherst community farm window restoration and this is a, a pretty small grant of forty five hundred dollars it's the final piece of a three-year project to um completely restore the exterior of the farm building at the north amherst community farm this is a the building that was originally um, in the Dickinson family. Um, it's a pretty central part of North Amherst. It's been in terrible shape. It's used to house people who work on the farm. Um, they've had a number of funding sources for the entire restoration project, but we were involved in the exterior, which meant uh, clabbards. It meant um, largely clabbards. It meant uh, uh, 
replacing the windows with historic windows um, in this last part is for the remaining window work and replacement of the window sashes. Um, the second proposal is the, um, I want to follow the list here, um, the, to update the historic resource inventory. This is $25,000. Um, this is something we haven't done in a long time, I think since 1988, and it's a a, a historic resource inventory of buildings. Um, this is something that's a, a pretty important part of the work of the town being able to understand its own inventory of historic structures. And, and we're, we're way overdue in this. Most towns do this in a, in a uh, uh, you know, they don't wait 20 years to do these plans. So um, we haven't done this in a long time. That's a $25,000 grant. Um, uh, there's a $50,000 grant for the West Cemetery headstone restoration. This is again, I think the third year we've invested in the West Cemetery, which um, is a pretty remarkable um, resource for Amherst uh, in um, historical resource. And there are still, you know, we're just kind of getting through area by area to replace some of these headstones that are um, have either fallen down or cracked, have been pushed down, or uh, are on the verge of, of collapse. There's some safety issues there, but it's really about um, really honoring uh, this historical resource and keeping it in, in really tip top condition. And I think this is the third year in a row we've invested in West Cemetery. Um, and then uh, I guess I guess those are the three. Yeah, I was including the library when I said four, but I'm not going to talk about. Uh, we'll come back to the library before we adjourn, but I'm trying to keep the ones we're going to vote on on June 15 separate, but I, we, we will get back to the library. Um, I see, um, so the remainder you would be putting into uh, reserve that is for historic reserve, uh, for historic preservation grants. And just so everybody knows that because we're required to spend a certain proportion on um, each category, if there's leftover, it has to go into a reserve that's for that category. Uh, Dave Zomack, I saw you, you've had a hand up for a little bit. I'm sorry, Andy, I was going to make a comment about um, affordable housing, but I think we've moved on, so I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you'd be welcome to come back to it. And Dorothy, you had your hand up for a minute, but I yes. see it's no longer there. Oh, no, no, it's still there. It's still there. Hold on. I can't find it. Okay, well, go, go, go. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask yeah. about the Civil War stones. In the detailed report, um, a sum of money was given, and I just, in, I came into one of your meetings late, and I, I know they're in storage somewhere, and I don't know whether you're paying a lot of money for the storage, or whether there is testing uh, going on in the stones now to decide what how much money is needed to restore them, or whether you're doing planning to get some money to bring them back to the town green or near the town hall. Um, I just want an update of what's happening with the Civil War stones. Oh. At first, I thought they were in the budget, but now it sounds like they're not in the budget. So, but there was some sum of money in the longer report. I'll pass this along to Dave Zomick. Okay. Thanks for your question, Dorothy. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are asking, uh, given recent um, a newspaper articles. So the Civil War tablets are actually completely restored. Uh, that money was spent a number of years ago. And so they are in storage. Uh, they are not costing us anything to store. They are professionally created, uh, having been professionally restored um, uh, to very high standards. We have looked for a number of years for the appropriate place to display them. They weigh, I'm going to say they range anywhere from 500 to maybe 800 pounds a piece. Uh, they're five to six, seven feet long by three or four feet uh, wide. Um, they are, despite their weight and their size, they are actually quite vulnerable to the elements. So they cannot be they cannot be um, displayed outdoors without extensive protection from the weather, water, heat, and UV. 
So for a number of years, we've been looking for a site to, um, to display them uh, for, of course, for their historical significance. So I think that search continues. Um, we have had some pretty extensive designs to try to, to try to display them outside and those were either deemed infeasible or cost prohibitive. So um, we've looked at buildings, indoor space like the town hall, which uh, impossible to, to display them here. We've looked uh, informally at the library, um, both the existing space plus the potential renovated spaces. Um, and then we've considered places like the school, schools, the elementary and the high school or middle school. So um, that's kind of where we are. I think we'd all love to display them, but they are priceless artifacts and need to be treated as such. So we've got to find the right place uh, at the right time for the right budget. So you may see a, a proposal coming back to CPA in the future um, once we've determined a, a potential uh, space for those. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there's nothing else than uh, you could go ahead and just speak to open space. Well, I do see Shalini with her hand up, so I'm gonna pause in the Shalini. Yeah, thank you. Just have a quick question. Is the percentage in which, according to which the funds are distributed, what's in the list here, the 50% for community, 10%, 6%, is that the ratio in which money is distributed? Well, we don't, you know, in any given year, we get different types of proposals, but we, we, for, if you leave recreation out of it for historical preservation, open space and housing, we have to designate at least 10% of our funds. Um, recreation, we could spend nothing if, if we didn't want to. Um, but we don't, in any given year, we don't say we want to spend 25% on each proposal because it, 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 different years you get different proposals. So we try, hope to average um, over the course of a number of years, um, equity. But uh, when I saw a report this year, I think over the last 10 years, um, we had spent um, significantly more money on affordable housing than the other three categories, but the other three categories were fairly similar. Is that, is that kind of what you were asking? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh. yeah. So I was going to say, if you want to just speak to open space and recreation, you could do the four together and then we'll see if we close. Okay. So um, we don't have any proposed land purchases this year for the first time in a while, uh, but we do have a $25,000 appropriation for trail maintenance and, and access. Um, you know, I think if you spend any time on uh, the, the trails, system in Amherst. It's a pretty remarkable resource for the town. That's a little rough around the edges. We've got some bridges that need repair. We need some kiosks and places that we don't have them, better signage, parking areas, things like that. And this is the beginning, we hope will be a multi-year uh, effort with CPA to begin the process of really investing in the infrastructure in our trails and open space. Um, so, and, and it's important to say that any CPA money designated for trail maintenance and access can only be used on properties purchased through CPA funds. Um, so that's a $25,000 appropriation. We also have a $25,000 appropriation for surveys, appraisals, and studies. Um, this is a fairly regular proposal that we get from the town. Um, this money isn't always spent, but it needs to be on hand. It needs to be available if an open space uh, opportunity arises, there's a lot of preparation that needs to go into um, to that proposal, surveying land, getting appraisals. Um, and this allows uh, the town, I think, to be a little more nimble in getting those, getting those jobs done um, prior to uh, potentially proposing the, the purchase of some open space land. And we've done this a, couple, a number of times since, since I've been on the committee. Uh, in terms of recreation, um, a very similar type of proposal to what I just said, which we haven't done in a while at all, as far as I know, um, is uh, recreation pre-development funds. And this is to address um, the same sort of issue. You know, one of the things I think that came up with the Kendrick Park playground is 
you know, we suddenly had the opportunity to get this grant and we had to jump through a lot of hoops pretty quickly uh, to make that happen. And, and we did. Um, but again, uh, as we think about investments in recreation, um, we want to be a little more nimble in terms of being able to prepare for kind of uh, pre-designed site work appraisals, that sort of thing, but dedicated to, to recreation specifically, not purchase of open space land. And finally, there's a $150,000, 500 appropriation um, to continue the engineering and design into the reconstruction of the high school track. This is part of a multi-town CPA uh, uh, gathering of monies for, um, the, uh, for the high school track, which is woefully in, in disrepair, um, it really almost unusable. Um, and um, it, it would be to get ready to sort of design to kind of move the direction of where the track is and, and, and begin the process of um, um, getting that whole process moving. And those are the four open space and recreation proposals. Mandy? Thank you. A um, couple questions about the high school track. Um, I believe that it is not the town's land, it is regional land. And so one question is, um, what does the, I guess the deed restriction or whatever look like on something like that? I know in the past for historic preservation, we've had deed restrictions on stuff. So I don't know what that looks like on say a recreation project that um, we as a town do not actually own. And, and then my other question related to that is, and I'm hoping you know the answer to this, have the other three towns also appropriated CPA monies for this project? Um, David, would you like to talk about the deed restriction? Do you know the answer to that question? Um, it's a really good question. And to be honest, th you know, this funding, um, so when we're doing architectural work, landscape architect work, um, or any kind of pre-development work, that doesn't, to my knowledge, doesn't require any kind of deed restriction. And, and that's what this money is for, is really to further the study. CPA invested, I'm going to say about $50,000 to do the initial uh, study of community field and, and, um, and um, the high school fields. And we share that uh, expense with the region. Um, and, and likewise, this is a step further. If we were, go, if we were to go to invest um, uh, construction money in a permanent facility, say a track and or a, uh, you know, a multi-purpose field there, um, I think that's where we'd have to explore um, would, that, would that property have to have a permanent restriction on it for open space or uh, active or passive recreation. So we've been talking to town council about it since we're not at that point and we know that it's a pretty big nut uh, to crack there if we go the full route. Um, we haven't fully in investigated that yet, but I think this is pre-development work for the further study of the feasibility of that. So that's, that's what I know. Yeah. Does anyone know the answer to whether the other towns have also recommended CPA funds for this? I, I thought Sean Mangana was on this Zoom, so he might know the answer to that. I was trying to hide over on the side, but you caught me. Um, we submitted requests to each of them. I don't know if they've approved them yet. Um, I can find out the answer to that from uh, Doug Slaughter, but we did submit requests to all the other committees to um, for their share of the, uh, the design work. Chris, right now they're struggling just to figure out where they can have a town meeting safely. Right, exactly. Andy, um, the, yes. I was going to mention they can't approve it till they have their town meetings. But um, the way this is listed, it says high school track and field replacement. So it makes it seem like we're already in the process of doing the replacement versus uh, looking into it. Could you clarify that 
particularly because of how David has um, described the issue of who owns the land. Do you want me to speak to that one, Nate, or? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, if it's the same as I remember when I was there, it is to take the sort of high level um, master plan type document that we, re we received from the prior um, landscape, uh, Weston and Samson, I believe, and, um, and to turn that into more of a schematic design so we can, we wanted to get more uh, accurate cost estimates. You may remember the last time we got the, the high level design, the, um, the cost estimates were somewhere between three to four to six million dollars. Um, and we wanted to get much more detail on what that cost would be. Um, so it's to convert sort of high level design work into you know, the beginnings of a, a true schematic design. I, I would like to make sure that the uh, actual wait, 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 wait. states that. I, I was just thinking Lynn's point, I think, is that maybe after the word um, replacement, it says replacement design, <laughs> you know, or replacement studies. So we're not physically replacing the track right now. We're doing the engineering study. We're, it needs one more word in the financial order. It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty clear in the paragraph. The paragraph says continue design and engineering work to replace, but it's not the replacement of the track. Right. Okay. Uh, we can have our um, staff consider whether they can add one word to the uh, order before the word draft is removed from it. Sort of substitution, drop draft and add one more word elsewhere. Uh, anything else in the way of questions about either um, open space or recreation at this point? Pat this has our hand up. Pat's hmm? handed up. Oh, Pat. Yeah, I'm just um, trying to clarify for myself. I. Um, the current 157,500 would be our share of what it costs to do this, uh, turn things into a schematic design. Um, but would we go ahead if we did not receive funding from the other towns in the region? I don't know if Sean wants to comment on that. Well, yeah, I can't, I mean, I can't speak for the region. It, it is meant to be the, the Amherst town share because um, when we were looking at this, we thought we needed about $200,000 to keep moving the design work forward. Um, so this was roughly the 80% or so um, of that amount. And then we requested the balance from the other towns. Um, I believe if we, if the other towns do not approve it, we can still go, or the region could still go forward um, with starting some of the design work, uh, but that would need to that have to be a conversation with the region. Lynn? So that just brings me back to how much more money do we want to invest until we clarify our how we own this or what we're investing in, and then the other question is if we felt we needed the other towns to put their money in we may want to hold this one off until we get the uh, results of town meetings. Yeah. I just, so part of the conversation around why this was requested was because there was a lot of urgency at the time to keep the design work moving forward. Um, as Nate mentioned, the, um, the track was in, was in pretty bad shape um, and we didn't want to lose momentum or progress from the prior report that, you know, started I think almost two years ago. Um, so I, I believe that's why the region kept this request moving forward is because we, there is some sort of sense of urgency to get the track replaced in the, in the near future. Um, Kathy, and then I see a, a member of the public, uh, Sarah. So why don't we start with Kathy? On mute. Um, so I'm wondering if, well, it's a two part question. One, if the if the answer is we could do something with a 157 500 which is its own odd little number because it's a 200,000 
So we would still want to spend that. If we would want to make it contingent on the other towns, can we asterisk contingent on them? And then my other, the other part of it is when I was at the presentation by Doug Slaughter to the CPA, he didn't have an exact amount, but he said, this is far less than you need for a design and engineering study. It's like the beginning of it because people, the actual proposal just Xerox the pages from the Western design, which was $4 million to $6 million. So people were saying exactly where does this fit in that giant proposal. But so I don't know whether we're like a down payment on it where we're paying half of it or half of it can be done. So, so Lynn, your question on can this move forward, my sense was it wasn't even all the money we needed, but I don't know whether it was for a corner of the field or for part of it. So some sense of how far would we would get if we spend this money over the next 12 months? Uh, Sarah, do you have anything to add? Sarah Marshall is uh, also a member of the CPA committee and she's asked to be recognized. So Sarah. Hi, thank you, Andy. Uh, I would just add um, to what Kathy said, uh, in response to Lynn's suggestion or wondering whether we, sh uh, Amherst should wait on voting this funding. Um, the other towns, if they only have one town meeting a year, that's their one shot to uh, award money that their CPA committees hopefully are recommending. Um, and it would be pretty depressing, I think, if Amherst had kicked the ball on it. So given that I, I, that we would bear the lion's share of the cost. I would hope that we would throw our, you know, throw our hat in the ring and say, we'll do it. And if the other towns don't come on board, well, the region may decide not to move forward. That's all, thank you. David? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess I wanted to just, uh, echo what Sarah said and also what Sean did and, and kind of put a, an exclamation point on that. I just, this is such an urgent project for all of us, for the region, for all of our athletes. Um, I don't see any downside and, and, and I fully support, you know, all the work that has gone before this been part of, of a lot of it um, to at least vote this um, the money's not going to go anywhere if we don't have a critical mass of funds to move the, the study forward, it won't happen. I mean, uh, Sean will be involved in that. I'll be involved in that. Mike Morris and, and Doug Slaughter. So we're not going to move forward unless we have a critical mass of funds to get us to a next step. Defining that next step today is probably not possible. I do know as an example, um, there, the uh, Tan Brook goes under the fields uh, west of the high school. So part of this money was to really look at the Tan Brook and the feasibility of improving those fields with the Tan Brook culverted under the field. So we have some work to do. I just want to say that, um, you know, I think Amherst should lead on this. And again, we are, you know, I don't think this money is going to be uh, to be ill spent uh, unless there's tangible steps that we can take toward a full design. So I think the urgency is there. If we wait and then the other towns balk somehow, then we've lost yet another period of time. It could be another year and the track is unusable pretty much as it is. So those are my thoughts. Dorothy. Okay. Um, when people talk about this and they raise this to me, their question is, why is it so outrageously expensive? And why does it cost that much money for studies that don't, doesn't, don't even include dirt or machines to move the dirt? I mean, people played on fields. I played on fields. I mean, if the field is a mess, then get a new field, go somewhere else and start with a better place. I mean, the idea that you spend all this money just on studies, I don't understand it and I can't explain it to people. So maybe, you could explain it to me. I see Sean's hand. Uh, Sean. So uh, 
you know, the way I interpreted this project when we were putting it forward is that it's, it's not meant to be a study. It's really meant to be the beginning of the design work for a new track and field. Um, the reason it's so expensive is, A, you probably heard that the other fields at the region are not in great shape either. And so this project is looking at whether we can do something like artificial turf or some other type of synthetic surface. It's looking at turning the track and field. Um, it's looking at the creation um, system and things like that for the field. It's, you know, this was a comprehensive um, study that we already did. We have the study piece has already been done um, to really improve all of the fields of the region. Because you probably recall a couple of years ago, or maybe it was just last year, where the fields you know, were unplayable at one point. And that wasn't even the track and field, that was the other fields. Um, mm -hmm. They were, you know, lack of water or overuse. Um, so this project is really meant to be the keystone of, you know, one strategy for getting the fields to be more usable all year round. Um, and it's, it's the biggest chunk. Um, it's part of a larger plan, but it is the bigger chunk. And so this money would be the beginning design work. So it would um, get us a certain, it, it allows us to keep moving the design forward, and then at a certain point, you have to come back and request more money for the, the rest of the design work. Okay. Andy? Yes. Uh, do not take any of my comments and questions regarding this project as anything other than full support for it. In fact, the fact that Amherst is paying more than other towns is fine with me. It is literally inside the borders of our town and used by our citizens as well as the students that and the teams. Uh, I'm just trying to get straight about, you know, who owns this, um, the other money necessary, and how much more is going to be spent on design before we can actually do it. What can we, what, what can we be anticipating down the road? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so, so the typically design costs and some of those soft costs are, you know, I mean, it's, it's evolving as things go forward, but somewhere between five and 15% of the construction costs. Um, so, you know, we sometimes use 10% as our rule of thumb. So if the project, you have to dig into the, the detail of that four to six million dollar estimate and find out what the, the construction cost is and then um, and then pull out the design. I think I think in that budget they did estimate a design fee in there. So we can get you the exact number um, around the design portion. Anything else on the proposals that we've heard today? Yeah, because the only other thing left, and I'll just say, and you can add, um, there's ten thousand dollars that's proposed every year for administrative expenses having to do with the CPA program, including membership in the coalition, um, statewide coalition of uh, CPA programs, and uh, that's been standard in every year's CPA budget uh, over time. So, does, is there anything to add to that, Nate? No, it's sta standard costs, dues to the coalition, legal notices in the newspaper, or that sort of thing. Good. So, um, that is, those are the things that we're going to be voting on on uh, June 15 as a council, and the two committees will be asked if they have recommendations <coughs> on those uh, on the proposals that are recommended uh, on this list. Uh, there's one additional proposal that is not on this list as I explained at the beginning of the meeting, um, but I wanted to give Nate an opportunity um, or Sarah to say anything that they want to on behalf of the committee um, about the Jones Library proposal and uh, if not, then uh, there's no members of the public attending at this point uh, um, who are not members of a committee other than uh, Sarah and Nate, and they're both now in the meeting themselves. So I'll treat, treat this as also the opportunity 
for any other public comment uh, from either of them about the issues in general. But Nate, is there anything you wanted to say about the library? Well, I, I just, I mean, I think if I can just explain a little bit the kind of awkwardness of where we are with this proposal. Um, I don't know how widely circulated the uh, the the statement uh, has been that that um, Diana Stein and Michael Burt Whistle and I wrote um, in opposition to a proposal that we all had voted for uh, a couple of months ago. So just to give a sense of how that happened, when we evaluate CPA proposals, um, we immediately dispatch the ones that have no support, put them aside. We take the ones that have almost universal support in the committee and we put them up on the board. And then we begin to have more detailed discussions on proposals where there's a kind of some split opinions or people aren't sure. And as we approve them, we put them up on the board. And then uh, at the end of the process, if we have enough money, we vote on the entire slate. We got interrupted because of the COVID-19 crisis before we were able to do that last step. But the library proposal was one of the first ones that we looked at. And as if we evaluated it, I think it was seven to zero to one um, in favor. After that, um, when we passed it, um, a couple of us began to get kind of cold feet about it and started doing a little research uh, on whether it really was an historical preservation project. And as we got more information, the more concerned we became. So at the, in our last, we didn't know it was gonna be our last meeting, but in our last meeting, um, <laughs> uh, we did a presentation to basically say, um, we really think we need to pull back on this Jones Library proposal for a couple of reasons that I think are outlined in, in that um, paper that we submitted. Um, it, it was hard to figure out a title for that document without impugning that there's some sort of schism on the committee. There's not. Um, it, it's just, it's very awkward timing in the sense that we, I can't, we can't communicate anymore our concerns to the rest of the committee as a violation of open meeting law. And the reason that we titled it a, a dissent or a disagreement was because we had originally voted for it. Um, and we assume that the three of us are uh, holding a minority position. I, I, I don't know if it's just the three of us or the outliers and the other six people on the committee are, are all gung ho for the pro proposal. I just don't know. But we felt strongly enough about it that we really wanted to keep the conversation going. Um, I think our preference would have been to continue meeting and I, I probably would have moved to reject the Jones proposal, made my argument, had someone make a counter argument and vote mm -hmm. and be done with it. But we weren't, we weren't able to do that. So um, hopefully, you know, we, w given this, this delay, we will get the chance to meet and, and, and hopefully as a committee, and we work very, very well together, um, close it out one way or the other. Sarah, I see your hand up. Yeah, I would just add to that, that um, at our March 5th, I think it was meeting, the last time we met and we discussed this at length, um, my takeaway was that we were, as a committee, was hoping to get more information. We already had an opinion from the town's attorney that supported the uh, the CPA that uh, the appropriateness of the proposal, um, but then we had some other opinions, other information that uh, was counter to that. So we were hoping to go right to the Commissioner of Revenue, I think, who of the for the Commonwealth, who oversees the program, and uh, try to get a definitive answer. And we were never able to do that. And that's what I recall was going to be our next step. Uh, we, we had discussed it internally, I think as, as much as we could, we needed more information to help us decide one way or another. And we didn't get there. Thanks. And I, I should say that you know, we referenced in our letter that Diana Stein had had a conversation with someone at DOR. The, we went, then went to the town manager to um, try to really engage a conversation with him in the room. And, and I think he made a really good faith effort to make that happen. But then all hell broke loose at the end of that week with COVID-19 and we just, we just couldn't get it done. But as Sarah says, 
that would be a definitive conversation if we could if we could have that. Yeah, uh, there should be two other people on the committee who've asked to be recognized. I'm going to get to them in a second. I just I, I um, thank you both for your comments from the committee. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, it was regrettable that um, this whole COVID crisis has come up and affected us in the way that it did and the IT couldn't support committee meetings initially, uh, creating this time bind. But um, when you and I talked earlier, Nate, I sort of felt because um, it's not going to be acted on one way or the other by the council soon, I wanted to concentrate today on what the council was is going to act on in June. And uh, that doesn't mean that that gives the committee time to come back and have further conversations if, if it wishes to do so. So, but I'm sorry that it happened in the way that it did. Uh, okay. Steve Schreiber. Yeah, so from what I hear from the way that Nate was describing that, that there was almost unanimous, maybe one dissent vote that the library project had support. And then it's really almost like a theoretical question as to whether or not it's historic preservation. It's been a while since I read the Koppelman, I'm sorry, the town attorney's letter. But from what I remember from that is that, yes, that the town can determine that this is historic preservation. So I guess I have a little bit of a problem arguing. There's a worthiness part of the project, which there sounds like there's a big agreement for that. I think that determining whether or not this is in the proper bucket, I don't know, that's that I would defer to the town attorney. We can keep asking questions and get the answer that we want, but typically the town relies on what its attorneys are. And I have, personally, I have a lot of problem with um, any of us going rogue and trying to act, ask people that we know that happen to be in the state house or were anywhere else you know, fishing for other answers because normally we rely on the town attorney. Well, we went to the coalition before the town went to the attorney. Yeah. So we didn't, we weren't, we weren't going on a fishing expedition. We were trying to get information and uh, because we're a member of the coalition and the coalition is really the kind of clearinghouse for information for CPA committees. Um, it seemed like that was a good way to go. I think the reaching out to the attorney was the town's decision after they saw the letter from the coalition. And to make it clear that it is um, the, the opinion, the minority statement from the three members, Nate and two other members of the committee, uh, CPA committee has been circulated to all members of the council, okay. not just this group. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I believe it was in your packet though. Um, and um, yeah, Nate, and then I, we have two other members of the committee who've asked to be recognized. So yeah, I, I just, I guess I'm a little put off by this implication that we come, some of us on the committee have gone rogue. Um, what we're trying to do in our approach to this project is to what we think is honoring the spirit of the CPA, um, in honoring the interests of Amherst taxpayers. Um, we're trying to play this by the rules, cleanly, with total integrity. Um, we've kept everybody informed. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to do the right thing here. We're not trying to go rogue. Uh, I, I just want to be really clear about that. This is, this is a committee that I think is still acting as one that wants to come to the right conclusion on this issue. Um, and the only reason this is appearing the way it is, is because we can't talk to each other. So I just want to be clear about that. Yeah, and if I may, I apologize for the implication of going rogue. Thanks. Uh, Dorothy, you have something? Yes, I do. Um, well, I was reading this over this um, just before the meeting started, and um, I certainly got the case that one of the problems with CPA money is that many towns want to use it to substitute for other town money when they need to do that. And that um, it's not to be used to subsidize buildings, but to for historic objects. And I, I believe you said in the report that there were no actually historic objects mentioned. Um, I mean, I can certainly see that be something that one has to guard and protect against. So 
um, I was thinking, am I gonna have to vote on this? Because I, I found a lot in the minority report to be persuasive. So I thought your, um, what Lynn announced at the beginning was a good solution. We don't have to deal with this now. So we're not gonna vote on it now. We're gonna vote on the other issues. And um, you know, the way will become clearer as we go forward. Um, so, but I do appreciate the minority report because I think it brought up, brought up a major issue for CPA funds everywhere how towns use the money. Do they use it to plug their own holes or for actually what's in the law? Um, could respond to that, but I think I'm gonna ask Kathy first to, because uh, she had her hand up. Um, yeah. yeah, I just I just wanna, I, I did think the minority report was excellent, it was very helpful. And one of the issues um, that Nate just emphasized was coming back together and this discussion with the Department of Revenue, because the the spirit of historic preservation, there's there would have been no question, as in the past, if we were repairing the roof on the historic Jones Building, or the facade of the historic Jones Building. I mean, the the act is very clear that we could repoint the stones or stuff. It was more, can you uh, apply it to a structure that is going to, a new structure that's going to house papers of historic interest and trying to get some clarity on that. And that's where the discussion was circling around on the comfort level. Cause the, the uh, Jones project made a decision why ever they did to not apply for money for the historic part of the building repair. They didn't apply for that. They applied for the special collection, a new space for it. So that's where this gray area and trying to honor the spirit of what is historic um, and get some clarity. So I think it's, I think the solution of waiting until you can come back together and we need to wait anyway as a council because of the lack of, um, we're not sure when the grant will come in and whether we have enough money in the town for our share. So everything would have been contingent anyway with this grant. It was only going to move forward if the major project moved forward. It's it's wrapped up. So I think the timing is great to because we can wait. This could be voted on next year. I mean, in July, in August, in September. I mean, it's not a time dependent decision right now. Um. I see uh, another hand up. I, what I was going to say is just on one other aspect of it, but in what Dorothy said, if um, we have frequently um, applied the policy when we have looked at buildings and building projects to use other grant sources and other funding sources, including CDBG and the Community Preservation Act to help us fund projects uh, and um, to the extent that we can do that, um, it um, helps us to have funds still available to do a little bit more with other capital needs. Um, it came up a little bit in the JCPC discussion, but it is a part of the December council budget guidelines. If you go back and about page three, I think it is, and look at the council budget guidelines from December, uh, that point is made there. And I can think of uh, numerous projects over the years that have been combinations of various pieces of um, money from sources of which CPA is one of them. Um, it's just the other day, um, looking through a list for other purposes and came back to the town hall amount and the part of the town hall work for the original renovation. I think the, the clock tower part was uh, done with CPA funds. So uh, you could argue that that could have been funded by other funds, but you know we, do, we have done this historically over time. And I think it is a longstanding town policy to try and do that. Um, Evan Ross, I see your hand has been up. Yeah, two, just two quick comments. Um, so one, I just want to push back on the idea that this is not that time sensitive that we could put this off for a while. 
um, just because it's contingent on the grant, because I think that a lot of these decisions um, and investments also show some signaling. And so just as we said that we needed to approve the CPA funding about a year ago for the um, 132 Northampton Road project, even though that project wasn't going to be using those funds immediately, in, able to show, in order to show investment um, for the state, similarly, every, every piece we do to shore up this project shows investment, right? And it signals to donor, I mean, they have an ambitious fundraising goal. Um, and so all of these pieces play into that. And so it's, to me, it's, it's actually not something where we can say, eh, we don't even know when we're gonna get the grant or accept the grant anyway, we can wait. Um, because there's a lot of moving pieces to this. And I don't think we can take it out of that broader context. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, I think that the struggle that we're facing is we asked, uh, we, the CPA committee asked for two opinions, one, uh, or, or collectively two opinions were received that are in conflict. Um, and, and you could ask for five other opinions from different entities and they might still be in conflict. And at some point you have to just decide um, what you're going to do with that. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, our town attorney opinion is the one that, that, that should prevail. And if there was interest in the CPAC committee to fund this project, which there was, it was a 701 vote. Um, if we have, uh, if we have the town attorney opinion that, that gives us uh, the cover to, to move forward with it, and there's interest, I, I'm not sure why we want to keep soliciting opinion after opinion. We have, we have a legal opinion that says we can do it. Uh, we clearly want to, this committee wanted to do it. Um, I don't want, I hope that too much time isn't spent going back and forth on this, um, if this is something the committee actually wants to see happen. So, if there's nothing else, is we're not really going to be dealing with the library right now, and um, I want to let the two committees continue their meetings. Um, if there's no objection, and I'm going to, um, and I'm really looking for raised hands to see if there's objection, then um, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mandy Joe to. Uh, take over for a moment and to recess her committee and give instructions as to how the, um, people can continue to participate in that committee meeting. And um, I'm gonna, um, during that period of time, uh, treat the finance committees in recess. So we will, as soon as uh, Mandy has finished that, continue with the finance committee meeting. So Mandy? Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, at this time, I'm going to recess. This is 3.22 p.m. I'm going to call about a five-minute recess of the CRC. Um, we will reconvene as soon as possible in the virtual meeting link for part two. So each of our committee members have received two virtual meeting links. We are going to head to part two link, which is just the CRC meeting link at this time. Um, for those in the public, there were two meeting links on the, count, the CRC agenda. If you wish to follow us to the continuation of the Community Resources Committee meeting, you will now move to the part two link, um, which was the second link on the agenda. And that is how you can join us there. So at this time, 3.22 p.m., we are in recess until we can reconvene in a new meeting. Thank you all, and thank you, Andy, and for accepting our joint meeting and hosting us as CRC. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, see you guys okay, later. We're going to have a vote on this now. Uh, we vote? The Finance Committee is going to continue its discussion as soon as uh, we. Do, do people on the Finance Committee want to have a couple minute recess, or shall we continue our meeting? I, I have to leave. I a hear no friend of mine is is. Uh, I think we should keep going. Goodbye. All right. Okay. So okay. No so vote. we will let. Uh, no, what we're going to, to do now, we're going to continue on to the. Um, we can go back to the agenda maybe for a moment, Lynn. If you're and uh, that will enable us to see how we're going to proceed with the rest of the meeting. Uh, 
So what we want to do now is, uh, you see it says after public comment, CRC will recess. There was no public to comment. Sarah was the only one who's not a member of the committee and not a presenter and she was on. So I had given her the opportunity. Um, and uh, the, uh, so we're now at the point below that uh, where um, it's time for finance committee discussion and possible committee vote um, to as to whether we have a recommendation on the financial order, um, which has to do with the proposals that everything but the library essentially that will be funded from FY21 funds. So um, we are back um, together just as a finance committee and I will continue from there and then we have two other items that we're going to take up afterwards. Um, one is the uh, one month budget this, um, that was presented to us the just an initial discussion because it is on future agendas and then I want to go over the proposed um, meeting schedule um, with you as far as it has our meetings and the entire budget process on one integrated document and I'll explain that document when we get to it but let's stay with CPA and finish it and see if we're ready to um, um, get to a recommendation today or we want to we could postpone that one week if we needed to uh, so maybe the first question I have is you think about it too in um, is whether there are any criteria that you would like to see applied to all grants um, and uh, how you would what, what you would um, think that the finance committee would be commenting on uh, as far as the uh, CPA proposals that are um, in the proposed order. Kathy, do you have anything on that or did you have other comment? Um, well, my comment, I think your first question is whether we were ready to move to vote and I am. Um, I think the discussion we had might be in a report if we vote out this that um, to the extent CPA comes back together and looks at post COVID after COVID, uh, they um, may want to look at the possibility of using some of the money they've had in reserves to consider projects at, in FY21 that weren't brought originally. You know, so I don't know quite how to phrase that, but the one that was suggested is if the Amherst Housing Trust would have wanted more money now that it knows it's doing rental subsidies and has a way to do it. So that's one that was raised as a could they do it and Sonia responded that because they reserved 50,000 for um, because of the large reserve they have. Um, that's in a general reserve that could be considered. Um, so if the committee will be meeting anyway, we might want to at least weigh in on, do we think that's a good idea? Would, should they be doing it over the summer? Should they be waiting a little bit in the fall to get a sense of um, where else we might need the CPA money? Um, so that was the one thought I had as we Discuss. I didn't have anything specific on any of the large projects, but I did wonder, you know, and one always cringes at the thought that I draw attention to a $25,000 one, but the $25,000 on surveys, appraisals, and studies, when I was there for um, Dave Zomack's presentation, this was, yes, we're not coming to you with any new land purchases, but we're always on the lookout for them. So, this would be out there, um, not not doing a general survey, but you know, thinking: Are there is there other land that you would want to come? And I think now is not the time to be talking about buying more land. Um, and so I'm going to, in another meeting, um, and I've already, you know, I, I'd like to find out what the status of Hickory Ridge is because we, if that project's not moving forward, we moved 
CPI money into it and we move money from reserves into purchasing that land. So we may need that in the next 12 months if it doesn't look like that project is coming to fruition. So the only one I, and, I, and I'm ready to vote positively for this, but just with caution that we don't really need a lot of proposals coming to us a year from now to buy, buy more land. So that's it. That's my comment. Two part. Okay. Um, Sonia, are you you still here? I think. No, Sonia or Sean are still on with our Sonia meeting. Sonia is here. Um, I think they may have split up. So Sonia is with us, and Sharon Marshall is with us. And I think the others may have gone over to CRC. So, uh, Sonia, did you hear the question that uh, had come up previously on the uh, right? One of the things that uh, was brought up was a question of what the status is with Hickory Ridge and what happens if it falls apart um, and is uh, the, the, we're not able to close on the deal. Um, the CPA portion, I assume, stays with the CPA funds. And yes. the, the, the other money that the, the council voted that uh, was to come out of uh, stabilization. Right. So there were three parts to that. There was funding, there was um, sale of real estate, which is another receipts reserve for appropriation, and there was stabilization funds. So if that doesn't go through, all the money would revert back to those three sources. Lynn? And I assume that the money for Hickory Ridge would revert back to open space. That depends on whether we met our 10% in another way. So it's, I, I am tracking that. If it, it came from undesignated, um, from the undesignated balance. So that's where it would revert back unless it reduced the 10%, which I would figure out before I turned it back. Okay, thank you. Andy, Mary Lou has her hand up too. I, I see the Mary Lou, I do see your hand up. Um, the other thing that I was uh, just going to comment on is that we've done this $25,000, uh, kept, kept that little piece of funding there because it's been experienced that we just don't know when an, something is going to come along that we might be interested in assessing whether it's feasible or not, and it gives the ability to go forward with that kind of an analysis when it comes up. It doesn't mean that it, that the money is going to be spent immediately on it, or um, but it, but it's to the point where at least uh, it, it would be good to find out whether what what's feasible. And I think that it's sort of in that category, and. Uh, sort of maintain that kind of capability through good times and bad times over a long period of time, going back even to the period um, after the 2008 recession. Uh, Mary Lou. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would uh, like to support what Kathy Schoen said about open space and the purchase of land, I think it would be wise to uh, look at that. I don't know if the council has a count on how many acres the town actually owns as open space. I think it's land around, you know, the um, wells uh, and wetland are important, but I also think um, buying up so much land um, it is something we need to look at because it also drives up property costs. The other thing is it would be worthwhile for counselors to know how much land is owned by Amherst College, by UMass, by Hampshire. In other words, how much open land 
really exists in town um, and how much more do we really need unless we're protecting you know watershed and that so I'm supporting what uh, Kathy Schoen has to say about open space hey Kathy your hand is up again so hey, I just you know as I said I didn't want to focus on something as relatively small as 25,000 but as Mandy did, I was looking at unspent funds, and I was there when Dave presented this. They got twenty-five thousand and twenty last year, and it hasn't been spent yet. You know, so he actually made a comment: "Is we don't, if you don't want to give us the full amount, we could take less." So I'm just not sure what it takes to be the um, be ready. Um, and so this would give a pool of. 50,000 is I'm understanding the sheets we just got from Nate today that there's 25 as yet unspent um, to be looking at this. So that was the only reason I, I raised it because my um, kind of antenna went up on uh, getting ready for this when I think we were um, feeling that we just bought a lot um, the year before. So that as I said, it's it's a small amount of money, you know, trail maintenance and everything else, I think makes sense with this. And leisure services, they presented their 25 more around the, getting money to rehab a park, you know, to put in something. So it wasn't by, it was doing some things that, that the town would highly value in terms of services. So that's the only reason I focused on that one line. Sonia, is, um, can you confirm that there's a, a balance left in that 25,000 that's uh, from the prior year? Yeah, I'll have to, um, there probably still is, but I, this report was done a month or two ago, so I'd have to go back in and look. Can I do that now? I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Okay. Because um, I think that, that it makes a relevant part of the discussion before we uh, get to it. Is there anything else that people would like to raise about the any, any of the proposals that are on the screen right now, which are the ones that are in the proposed order? There was a question that has been raised about, and I think, um, would we want to say something about um, welcoming any um, future comments for, or, or, or we would consider future requests on affordable housing if they come forward. Uh, sort of peculiar because uh, we're actually voting on a very specific order and it's sort of like strenuous to the order. Yeah, I just meant, I thought you were in the context of the report we write up. Um, I was, uh, I was ready to just focus on this and I thought you wanted some additional conversation yeah. and that was the only thing that I thought got raised during the discussion. <laughs> so let's look. Sonia, come to a uh, come to the answer, um, and uh, and I don't know if um, Sean is still in the building or not. Um, is the other two things? Maybe we could. Um, switch to the third agenda item and then come back to the one month budget because I want to take up the one month budget without finance department staff being present. So um, if you could turn to the draft um, of the uh, plan for future meetings and action and financial decision making process. Yep. Hold on.
Is it now? Okay, I have to go stop sharing and go back. Okay. Um, so what happened while while she while Lynn is getting the uh, proper document? Um, I've been engaged in a process for the past uh, here. It's coming up uh, for the past several weeks where I've been working with Paul, Sean, and Sonia, um, and Lynn to try and um, visualize how the process is going to work in order to do all of the things that we need to do over the next several months, which is going to get us to an FY21 budget um, after we've in get us to a one month budget to take us um, through to the period um, until we can get to the one year budget because we're hoping for more information about um, revenues to project into the 21 budget before we finally do that, as well as uh, a lot of expense uh, work that needs to be done in the, um, this post COVID uh, crisis period during COVID and post COVID. And so, and uh, for those reasons, it needed to, we needed some time plus the regional school budget has been uh, put onto a different schedule than usual. So um, I had sent you as an attachment, the item that is on your screen that shows um, what the revised plan would be. And what you'll see in there um, is a number of uh, finance committee meetings. Uh, in the finance committee meetings, uh, um, each, each one is where we would have a role to play. And uh, when you look at the period after the manager submits the one year budget, uh, which is really gets into that second page, um, there are a number of meetings then um, where we really get into a high degree of uh, uh, frequency for our meetings, which would have happened in May, except that May got postponed until uh, July, essentially. Um, but if we're going to do what our finance committees have historically done, and uh, we would receive the budget and then um, the, after we receive the budget on uh, to June 29th, then have a series of meetings to review the budget and uh, go forward from, from there. And uh, so that's what the uh, uh, plan would, would look like. And uh, so I wanted to know um, if you're if you feel comfortable with the proposed schedule, because it does call for a fair amount of July meetings. But uh, can we get our work done without doing it? And I it hasn't been the habit of finance committees to do that. So, um, is there any comments on or questions about the proposed schedule? Andy, I just want to point out to people that more than likely these will all be virtual. We don't envision being back in the town room for meetings until the earliest, probably late August, September. The, the only question I had, um, it wasn't a question, I, I'm fine with the schedule, is when in the weeks in July when we're meeting twice, are we going to, is, is every, I'm assuming, I just put it in my calendar as 2.30 on the Thursdays, because um, we have Tuesdays and Thursdays, so is the time the same? Um, it's useful for me to block the time in my calendar. Um, so there's several Thursdays in there. The others are already blocked because they're council meetings and they're finance meetings. So it's, it's those Thursdays, Andy. I think that's up to the committee in part to make that determination. Um, I think last year that was what we did. We just kept with the time that we had been meeting, but we don't have to. We can 
Right. Do we, if we could do anything. That's the, that's why I raised it. I don't know whether this um, time we had one. Right. We were we were juggling someone who worked, um, and two thirty was a stretch, but not on Thursdays. You know. So I just don't know. Uh, other people are on the line. So just a reaction to both the calendar, but also the Thursday time slot. Does that work? Dorothy is not teaching during the summer, so I don't see that as a problem. She had to leave today because of a, a, a family issue. Pat? Two hands up. Pat, do you yeah, Pat, Pat, I saw. Um, I can do the Thursdays at 2.30. And Bob? Yeah, I was just going to say I can do uh, really any time on Thursdays. There's another issue that's related to this that I wanted to um, bring up. Mary Lou and I had a conversation outside of the uh, um, formal meeting, and now I can actually report on it just because it's in the we're in open session. And that is uh, in the old finance committee. Uh, we used to divide up into the into the sections that are evident by the presentations and have different people from the committee um, sort of take a higher level of role and um, help draft um, a short explanatory section. I think that we did less last year because the council is more actively engaged in um, than town meeting is, so it was a little bit different. But Mary Lou is uh, raising the question if we wanted to go back to that a little bit um, and uh, have uh, each of us take on um, a little bit more extensive role um, in any one section or group of sections Thank and you. then help to write the report. Mary Lou, did you have anything you wanted to say as to whether I misinterpreted our conversation? No, <clears throat> you are, are accurate in that. It, it could be council members, it could be the <clears throat> non-voting residents, but I, I think it was useful for one, you know, one person to have a lot of knowledge about the different uh, departments of the town. Um, it's good for everyone to have an overview of it all, but there's so much involved with each of those departments that I, I found it useful. Now, whether you would, you know, the council would, I don't know, but I, I think uh, old finance committee members found it very useful. And helpful. Last, last year, what happened in part was, is that the council had gone through a very extensive period uh, during the months January, February, and March, where each of the department heads came in and met with the council and explained in great detail what the department did, how it established its goals, what its plans were. So when we got the budget book, it attached very cleanly to the presentations we'd received before. Uh, we're now into a, into a different year. We're, we're a year past that. And uh, so we, I, th I think that the, the brevity of the report last year was partly recognition that we didn't need to repeat what the committee had, what the council had already heard in great detail, which is um, But I, um, I still think it was, it was a good question as to whether, for example, uh, Mary Lou did the schools for several years, whether having somebody who's a little bit more extensively researching the school issues and saying a little bit more about schools than um, whatever is in, uh, to sort of put it together in a way that's helpful to the, might be helpful to the council. Thoughts on any additional comments on this? Or any opposition to the idea? Uh, 
Um, I think otherwise we need, we would just want to get into the presentations and hear from groups and then uh, we still need, we still can make the decision at that point that uh, we would each take sections to write uh, where we would take the, the budget as presented by the town manager and the presentation and, and supplement the two together. Kathy? You, Kathy, you need to unmute. I thought part of the suggestion, and I like the idea a lot, would be that when we are hearing about the proposal for the school, someone would have more knowledge so they could lead the questions that we're asking when the people are with us, not so much after that discussion is over. Um, so I might have misheard what you were saying because the, um, uh, on this. So, I mean, I like that idea. It's just, I think we would have to decide pretty soon on who's on education, who's on water and sewer, who's on, you know, DPW, you know, I mean, we would just have to divide it up sooner rather than later. Um, and and for, for those who didn't sit through this in May, I don't know what, what form it will come to us, but we got a very thick book with a lot of pages in it for each of these departments um, with appendices, you know, so knowing that someone was going to take something that was a large department with a lot of money, at least one of us was, would mean that other you could focus somewhere else. So I didn't know whether the suggestion, Andy, was to come into the room on the, you know, if it's starting on June 30th, there's June 30th, July 2nd, those are the department meetings where presumably Guilford would be there for public works and Mike would be there for schools. Um, so come prepared to um, have thought about it before you got in the room. <laughs> uh, we can do that. That's a good, actually we could uh, either, in one of our next two meetings, we could come to a final decision. I could ask people if they have a particular interest in a section to email me and then I can present it back to you and we could make a final decision at our next meeting or the meeting after about what it is that uh, we would want to, uh, to do uh, as far as who's dividing to which budget. But if that makes sense, we'll, we'll do that. And I'll just send out a reminder email afterwards asking people if asking each of you and all members of the committee are involved in this. We're, we're, we're a single committee. So we're, in, we're proceeding as a single committee. So I'd, I'd ask you to email if there's a section of the um, budget that you're particularly interested in, try and make sure we get, get it divided up and then uh, it'll help prepare for the beginning part of the questions and help for the follow-up when we have to make a report. Does that seem agreeable? Uh, I yeah. see I, Lynn. Andy, I heard it as two things. One is um, paying more attention to the detail, maybe going into the conversation, but then also basically write that section or at least the initial draft of that section for the report. Yes. Okay. That's why I understood it too. Yeah. So, um, the the remind the request will be um, within the next week to send me back a note if there are any particular sections you're interested in, uh, and then that'll give me the opportunity uh, to work with Kathy and his, who's vice chair and uh, come up with a plan. Uh, Bob. Yeah, I I just have a general question about what the budget booklet will look like. Um, is there going to be any kind of section on, you know, here's how we have pared the budget down compared to what we normally would have um, put 
put in or is it just going to be here's what we're asking for and andy my yeah my understanding is it'll be a budget book booklet like every year and there always is a comparison to at least one year behind you okay one year that you're through so i think we all are going to need that but you, it will it will be a budget booklet like we always get but what we might what we might not have i mean i just was looking at what the regional schools did when they came to us is this is an unusual year we had what we thought fy 21 was going to be and now we've paired it back so paul may do, you know, paul may do a, you know a introduction from the town manager going in march of this year or in february of this year we thought it was going to be this you know, and it was going to increase from FY20 by this much, and now we're here. So we've kind of done those, the skeleton of that big picture look. But then what we don't know is how did each of these departments um, uh, turn on a dime when they thought they were going to have some growth, and now they're told have just, they had the same amount of money as they had last year, especially the town departments. Um, how did they live with that? Yeah. I don't think there's any intention to show what they were hoping for in FY21. Right. I right. think all we'll show is FY19 and what they're asking for in FY21, and that will include the one month budget amounts. Okay. So I think that we have the there were, were there any other questions about the proposed uh plan in and of itself as to how we get to the uh, uh through this entire process and the series of steps that were defined and spaced into dates and we tried to court what we tried to do obviously is correlate the work of the various committees with and mostly our committee of course and uh the council when the council would act and when we would act in order to make proper recommendations. So it was in um, the only thing that's a little bit unclear is where we are with the regional schools, uh, which I'm gonna, we'll talk about it separately. Um, the piece on the regional the piece on the regional schools, I'll be really brief and then we're going to turn back to finish up the Community Preservation Act discussion. Uh, the regional schools uh, have the potential of doing a one month budget. Um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is recognizing that schools are um, regional schools have a challenge because of the inability of some towns to organize town meetings as quickly as they normally do. And um, they want to have budgets that are approved by all member communities or the sufficient number of member communities to constitute three quarters, which makes for a binding budget uh, by uh, July 1st. But if not, they want every region to be prepared to go to a 112th budget. So uh, a 112 budget is an entirely different process. And uh, it's really something that is done by uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education based upon input from the regional um, staff. So uh, that's kind of where we are at. Um, and we are moving forward with the assumption that we have we're we have a regional budget It has been presented to us and uh, we're going to uh, try and keep moving through the process so that we are prepared to act this month. And as we find out what our uh, fellow communities are able to do in scheduling town meetings um, and how they're prepared to move forward with the timetable, um, see if we um, can be in sync with them so that we put down the um, last council meeting of this month, um, which is I think June 29th, in order to have a target date to um, have the budget. The superintendent will be at that meeting 
which is posted as a uh, meeting of the Finance Committee and the Council for next Monday. Um, there are actually two hearings that are scheduled in that similar fashion. And uh, they're required by the Charter that there be uh, Finance Committee hearings on all sections of the budget and all budgets. So we're required to have a hearing on the one month budget and we're required to have a hearing on the region budget. So the superintendent and uh, Doug Slaughter, who's now the finance director of the, uh, for the region are going to present the budget um, to the entire council and to the entire finance committee. Everybody um, who's on this meeting is a part of that meeting too. So that's our opportunity to hear their presentation and ask questions of the superintendent and uh, the school finance director. Um, and uh, so please be prepared to be present uh, for that meeting and then we will talk about it as course finance committee separately afterwards, but that is also uh, posted as a public hearing. So we will hear from members of the public who will have questions about the budget, which you already have. So is that a is that process understandable, Mary Lou? Did you have something? Yes. Were you gonna say something or should I go on? If not, what I'm what we're going to do then is turn back to the uh, Community Preservation Act and uh, see if we have uh, an answer to the question that um, Sonia was looking up, which to remind everybody was going back to the twenty-five thousand dollar amount for um, a fund available to look at uh, potential land purchases as they became available. Um, and uh, Sonia, did um, it was is that twenty five thousand dollars that was allocated last year? Was any of it spent? Uh, it's the same balance that's on the report. Yeah, so whatever was in the report is still accurate in terms of leftover amounts. <laughs> Where was that? I have to go back to the report to look, unless we were calls. You want me to try to bring it up, Andy? It was $19,000 in last year. So I said $19,000. $19,791.76. So almost, almost $20,000. So do we have a recommendation that we want to make on um, the proposed order? Lynn. Yeah, I'd like to move that we recommend to the town council that they accept the recommendation for this these expenditures of the CPA money this year. I hear a second. I second. I second. Okay, the motion is made and seconded, and that keeps the $25,000 as allocated money. And as of, I, I think in the following year, though, if it gets to the point where there's $45,000 that have not been spent, that um, could be repurposed. Lynn has her hand up. It's an open space. Yeah, let me also say that I really like the idea that we do a, um, we look very carefully at what money's not been ex expended. And after a three year period, we bring it back in. Good idea. Even if it's town money, I, I it's just sitting out there and there's no reason for it. I just want to note also in the CPA report, the very last page shows articles, some of the articles and projects that were closed out to fund balance. So we also track that. So things are getting closed as we're sure the projects are completely done. 
Um, could they close a little faster at times? Absolutely. But I just want to point out that they are getting closed. And that's, there's a report of that at the end of the CPA report. Okay. Now, I, and I thought at least the committee was talking about, and I think it's a good process, you know, if it's open, find out why it's open. I and mean, if it's just they didn't get around to closing it, close it. If they're about to finish it, you know, it was like it's a t time limited that you don't just wait till five years have gone by. You're, you're thinking like three years is the magic number or two years. And they said they didn't notify people when they've made the awards, you know, so going forward saying, you know, we, we expect to hear from you. It's something, this was what I, I heard the committee discussion. How do you alert people in advance that um, you're going to be expecting the money back if they end up not actually needing all of it um, in a timely way? There's the 19. Okay. So, can you know, I just say some things? I haven't done the CPA, I haven't been the liaison to the CPA committee in a bit, but the actual um, proposal that goes out gives it a three year limit. So, when they're making that proposal, they'll be asked if there's any outstanding money and where they're at with that. And they're told in that proposal that they have three years. From, from the day the one is available, which is usually July 1st. We want to include that in our report as in additional information that the committee um, has identified the, the policy about three years and um, to um, say that we encourage the continued application of that policy. I think so. I think so. Hagner has her hand up. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think we should actually. Um, I, I think it's just a good management practice to require that at the end of three years, you either close the project or you you know you close the project unless there's some reason not to. That's a reasonable re you know a good reason, and if there's money unspent, you close the project and get the money back. You know. I just think that's good management. So, um, when you were the maker, of the, the original maker of the motion, can we have the motion be that uh, the committee is going to submit a report to the council recommending everything that is in the proposed order and add the uh, that we would we encourage the Community Preservation Act Committee every year to look at um, the balances and to uh, determine whether um, uh, funds have been expended within a three year period. And if not, and there's no reasonable expl explanation, why not that it consider whether the grant should continue as being open and available or be I accept, I accept that amendment. <laughs> And I'm just wondering, do we need to vote separately on this financial order and that, or can we combine them that way, Andy? I, I actually was going to suggest we separate them. I, I think separating them would be good because there's a specific thing we can, it's even got a name up at top that we can refer to that we voted on. And then we, in addition to it, it the order is FY21. You know, we can. Okay. Well, I, I'll, I'll accept that and keep that as two separate motions. Okay. So the motion on the floor is uh, that recommending appropriation order FY21-07 as presented um, and all projects that are in listed in that order is recommended by the Finance Committee to the Council. So any further discussion? Uh, this is the opportunity for members who are non-voting to be able to say anything additional before we vote. If not, then I'm going to go for a roll call vote as required. Um, so, Pat D'Angelis? Yes. Um, Lynn Griesmer? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Oh, Dorothy had to leave. 
Right. Um, so that she's absent, Kathy? Yes. And I, and I'm yes. So it's four to zero with one member absent. And then is there a second motion? So how do we word it? So we, we recommend that the Community Preservation Act um, revisit every grant within three years and close it unless there is a good reason to continue. And I second that. Okay, so there's been a motion by Kathy, seconded by Lynn. Any discussion? Can I just say the only discussion I would have is a few of these. Um, I'm just thinking of um, a major building project that takes several years, but that would, I guess that would qualify. You know, I'm, yeah. you know right. this would qualify. We would still look at it. Did it even start? Is it in progress? So then it still, it still works. It won't be finished, but it still works. Right. So I, I can, yeah, I'm sorry. My, my concern yeah. is things like the E Street school money just sitting there. Right. Well, the E Street school money is actually an interesting problem that you have to decide on because the, um, the idea wasn't that it was ever given by the town meeting or the and recommendation of the Community Preservation Act for the East Street School. It was given to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust to have funds available to address affordable housing issues and be able to flexibly address projects and needs as they identified. They are a town committee that has the authority as a separate trust to make decisions to expend funds. Uh, and uh, I think the question that then flows from that is, if they've been unable to expend funds, should they be, should, should more funds be added in any given year? And each year we would expect the CPA committee and then the council to look at the amount of the balance in the affordable housing trust and to determine whether the balance is sufficient to give them the flexibility that they need to move forward or at what point do we uh, stop giving funds to the affordable housing trust essentially who has Andy, I just want to say that Sharon has her hand up too. Yeah. So I just wanted to get that clarified. Sharon. I just wanted to make sure that uh, the language um, closing the project means also returning the money, just to be clear. Like the money must be returned or the money is returned at the closing of the project or I don't know whether we need to add that or not. Sonia, uh, if money is, does money get it sent to the no. grantee? No, it stays in the town's treasurer until work is done, either reimbursed for work or there's um, progress reports, but the money's in the town treasurer, it doesn't get released. Well, I guess my point is that, that it gets put back into a different, um, it, it, does that need to be specified or does that, does that happen automatically when a project is closed? It, it goes, put back to the funding source, original funding source. So if it was CPA fund balance, it would go there. If it was a reserve, it would go there. Whatever the funding source was. So going to the Valley CDC first time home buyers program, uh, mortgage subsidy program, until they have identified um, somebody and has. Um, and are actually making a loan subsidy arrangement that with the expenditure of funds for that identified individual, the money is in the town um, accounts, not in CDC's account. Yes. So the the the, the uh, question of if uh, something we're going to be taken. Uh, 
back. It's the ability to continue to to look to that fund, not the ability, not the actual capture of recapture of dollars. Yes, even the um, trust, even the affordable housing trust, it is in the town's treasury. It's not in a separate area, and they have to follow all the procurement laws, and they also have. They're also held to any CPA regulations because it is CPA funding. It still has to be spent with a lawful purpose there. That's all Secret. regulated. So, the, so an additional question I would ask about Valley CDC program, which is one that I picked on before. They have a provision in their proposal that if um, money is uh, provided to a home buyer and that the home buyer then as they repay or if um, they no longer qualify and it's recaptured, do it go, does it get recaptured by Valley CDC or is that a, or does it get captured by us or is that to be determined? That I'm not sure of. That would be a question for Nate on the way. I'll run that by him. I'm pretty sure it stays with the, um, I think the restriction just gets uh, transferred down to the next person, but I, I'll double check on it. I have no Nate answer that one. Because I was thinking that there's, we have other programs like that. Um, I think uh, it's on the property, it stays with the property. It's been a while. I'm pretty sure that's what happens. But there is the provision that uh, money ultimately gets repaid back to Valley CDC, and they were anticipating that they would then identify new homeowners down the line who would qualify. So, so we'll follow up with um, Nathan and get back to you guys. Is this an issue that is significant enough that anyone wants to uh, um, reconsider was, the last vote? I, I, had, um, I have a hazy memory of this, so I'm not going to say what, but when Valley CD presented this new grant, there was a discussion about this, and Valley CD say, C said, well, of course, you could write it that it came back to you. We would prefer that it you know, sits in a pot for another person. So it, it sound, but, but Nate will know whether, how we wrote the last one and whether we have the flexibility, depending on what we want to do. Um, do we want to, you know, make it available for another first time home buyer or not? But it sounded like that they've done these in other towns in both directions. But as I said, my memory, I didn't take written down notes. I took my mental notes, probably. The minutes might reflect that, but they certainly, that was discussed during their review of this project. Ed, your potential, your hand is up. Uh, Thank you, Andy. I am, uh, so I'm the newest member on the committee and uh, my background is limited right now. I'm, it seems to me that different funds, the different projects that we fund are very specific, but the, what we might call back is very different. So it seems to me, I would like to see that first time home buyers keep their money because then they, it would be available for other first-time home buyers. Where another fund, I might not feel that way. So it seems like we need to make, or I would like to see us make these decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. But I agree with the general um, thought about money being returned after three years if it's not being used. So, um... Why don't we chirp? That's a good point. And maybe what we're really saying is that if Valley CDC is not finding buyers and the funds are just sitting at Valley CDC, 
then they're not being expended for the purpose. And that's really a part of what we're trying to do. And we will craft the uh, wording of your report to reflect that sentiment. Great. Sonia. Yeah. I'm just wondering if um, this is more of a committee discussion for CPA committee since they have the um, Community Preservation Act plan and, and their, their policies and procedures. So it should be something that they would be discussing to, print, to put in there because I'm not sure voting it here is going to make it happen there. So I'm just wondering about the process. Your process is this, this part of the motion, why we separated out is we're really making a recommendation in part back to the CPA committee okay. and doing it this way. Okay, I was just trying to understand the whole. But I don't think it's, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to council action. Council action is the order. So uh, is that consistent with the motion, Kathy? Yes. Presumably someone, someone or, Someone wrote it down, so yeah. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Here's the any comments from the com committee members who are who are not going to be voting when I do the roll call. Seeing none, uh, we'll go. Through, I'll just go through the same order. Pat. Yes. Lynn. Yes. Uh, we'll indicate Dorothy's absence. Kathy? Yes. And I'm yes. So it's four to zero with one member absent. Uh, so the only agenda item that's left is whether there are any immediate questions about the one month budget. If not, we'll take that up at the next meeting. And what I would encourage you to do think very carefully if we don't have questions now about issues that you'd like to raise. Lynn? Andy, I think in an earlier discussion or somewhere, I saw that we, we'd we like to make sure we understand which parts of the one month budget are one time only and which parts are considered to be that month, what is needed that month for that group. So we know, for example, retirement is a one time at the beginning of the year payment, we do it because we get a discount by paying it early. Are there other things in the one month budget like that? And that could, that's for next week. Yes. Um, Did you want to say, I, we just got it last night. I had that same question, but just we can funnel questions through you, Andy. So that can be part of next week's discussion. Um, you know, we haven't seen the, you know, the school, the, the school pieces. I, I don't know which things, because one of the discussions they had is do they have to invest some things in the school property? But I think that's a great question to get answered. Do you want to see the- I had read... Go on. Lynn, were you saying something? I'm just, I just was going to put it up. Putting up the one. So what I had done is an additional spreadsheet and is um, was to take the one year budget and divide it into 12 and compare one twelfth of the annual budget against the amount in each column where it's able to do that. And when you do that, what I found was is that for the um, town operating budget line, elementary schools and library services, that um, in each of those lines, the one month was less than one twelfth. And so I had said, um, <laughs> was there a reason for that? And Sean had come back with a little bit of an explanation, but. I think that was one level of question that I had posed. Um, then the other thing was in the, uh, the series of questions about enterprise funds. Right. 
because enterprise funds didn't necessarily work that way. And um, there's no ability um, if enterprise funds are overspending and we don't have the revenue coming in because of um, university not coming fully back in session, what happens? Um, we're not going to have the revenue coming in at the same rate. Um, and we, it's not like we have the depth of reserves. And so I was asking about the, each of those um, enterprise funds has a reserve balance and wanting to understand what the impact was in the reserve balance for each of them. So those were questions that I had sort of thrown out as an initial group. So think about questions for, that we want to pose. And when you look at the, the plan, that's one of our things for next week. And uh, yeah. it'll, uh, you'll get my spreadsheet and my initial set of questions in more detail. Anything else people want to ask about the one month budget now? Because if not, then I think that we have nothing else that hasn't this in the unanticipated category and we can adjourn. Okay. You're seeing nothing then. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and um, when you're adjourning the finance committee meeting at uh, 430. <laughs>